Open your Bible to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And you may be wondering why we're in Romans if we're not in Romans anymore. Because we're back in Romans, but we want to play We the People because they go hand in hand. I told you way back when that when, we, when the Lord leads us to a book of the Bible, that I'm going to be faithful to that call, and I'm going to just preach through that Bible, through that book, and I'm not going to dodge any issues. What's there is there, and if I want to run and hide, tough. That's just the way it is, okay? So when I tell you to open your Bible to Romans chapter 13, and our, we're going to start in verse 8, you may have marked down where we ended up, and said, wait a minute, you're missing, you're skipping, and I'm not doing that. Okay, I'm not skipping. We ended in Romans 12, and we're going to go to Romans 13, starting in verse 1, next week, because I do believe that that section, 1 through 7, it goes hand in hand with chapter 14. So there's some really awesome stuff in there, but I, and I don't want to miss it. It's just, I, I think that it just works well with chapter 14, where we'll go next week, Okay. Um, like I said, the We the People, um, this series, it, 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 it was to establish who we were when, when God moved our church to Eustis, and no one saw that one coming, right? No one thought we were going to move to Eustis, but now here we are, so we're trying to figure out what in the world does God have us in Eustis for? What is he trying to do in us and through us as a church and so we're trying to establish that and we've got we had some brainstorming and we talked about church being way more than come and pray and preach and then go home that we could be way more than that we started talking about racial reconciliation last week that was a, a big thing and that's on the radar and it's staying on the radar and that's not going away so whatever we do as a church I, you just know this that while you're off doing your jobs I'm going to be here massaging things even if you don't know it toward racial reconciliation that's going to happen here even if it offends and that's okay that's okay okay so um we, we established that but what we did is we interfered with the book of romans which was uh god his way of explaining the gospel to us it was more than just some dude that was sinless died and you get to say yes to him and you get to have heaven 
Like that's the normal gospel to, to America, but we wanted to dive in deeper than that so we had a full understanding of the gospel so we could know how, exactly how, how we get saved. What is saved? What's it for? Where does it come from? What's up, chef? Where does it come from? What's it for? Who gets it? Who doesn't? Do I keep it? Do I lose? All these different questions, and we wanted to make sure that we answered those questions, so we studied through the, the, the book of Romans in our series called The HD Gospel, The Gospel in High Definition. So we, we, we stopped that. And so we could start the other one, but really they go hand in hand, and you're going to see that uh, it's very apparent tonight. Now, before we study uh, God's word tonight, I want to tell you that I am painfully aware of the dark places in the world. I'm painfully aware, even though I don't have television anymore, it doesn't make a difference because I have a phone, right? And so everything's there. I am painfully, as most of you are, aware of the dark places in our world. I'm talking about, you know, young girls in, 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 in sex trafficking and, and AIDS are, are ravaging these communities in Africa and, and massive drug havens all over the world where kids are just being destroyed one after another by the dozens, by the hundreds, by the thousands. I understand all of that. And all of us really get that. And, and so what we do is we, we, using the gospel as our bullet, right? That's our silver bullet. We're going to fix the world with the gospel. And so we send people over to these dark, dark, dark places, and we send our money by the millions, and we pray before them, and we pray behind them, and some of us will even be the ones to go, and we bring the gospel. We think that the gospel is the fix-it for everything, and I agree but we like, you know what? There's sex trafficking. They need the gospel, right? We, we see it all the time. They, there, there's massive drug problems. They need the gospel. And I agree because it gives hope. It gives freedom. Jesus did something on the cross to set people free. And we know that. And so we resource these efforts to bring the gospel to the world because that's the fix it for all things. And I agree, but here's the thing. And I don't even really know what file to put this in, so maybe you can help me, but I feel like to even think that is, is, is kind of, and let me finish my statement before you throw something at me, foolish or arrogant in, in, in this. The reason why I say that is because we think that that will fix everything, but yet we won't exercise or embrace that same gospel in our own little dark areas of our own life. It's the, it's the, it's the Christian who says, well, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, but. Yeah, I know that he or she is this, but gospel says this, but you don't know how bad he is. You don't know what he did to me. Listen, if we will resource by the millions these, these mission workers to go across the earth because there's sex trafficking, and if they could just embrace what Jesus did on the cross, it would shed light into this dark area. We believe that, right? We don't believe that same gospel will fix our marriage. What's up? And we need to do that. We, we need to send money overseas. We need to do that. I get it. But we need to let the gospel invade our dark areas before we could. Did you ever been on a plane? Who's been on a plane? What do they tell you about the oxygen mask? Right? Same principle applies. You can't put the oxygen mask on her if I, haven't, if, if I'm, if I can't breathe. I can't help her, right? And so it's the same thing. We need to make sure that the, that the gospel will invade our dark spaces. I understand we're not living in sex traffic neighborhoods. I understand that there's not crack pipes on our front step right now. I get that. There's no dead hookers on the step when I get here like some churches get in this country. I get it. But there's still dark areas, right, in our lives that the gospel, I hate to say it, is dying to invade. Jesus is dying to invade your dark areas, and I want to do that tonight, okay? You guys with me? Let, let's just talk, let's just start here. We're in a culture here in America of, of very much a do, do, do to get, get, get. Okay, what I mean by that is we will work 40, 50 hours a week. We work, 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 and then because we work, 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 we expect something, don't we? What do we expect? 
We, all, we want pay, right? We're gonna, the more we work, the more efficiently we work, the harder we work, the more we get paid. That's the way we think. That's our, mind, that's our mentality. The more I work, the more I earn pay. I want to be good. I don't want to use this word because it's not a real word, but I want to be gooder. Let's be gooder. I want to be more gooder. I want to be more uh, charitable. If I'm more good and I'm more charitable, what will I get? I'll get better karma. I get it. I hear it all the time. The, the better I am, the more good that I do, the more good karma I will get. And I want to look good too. Because in our culture, if the better I look, the more people praise me. The more people exalt me. I'm more lifted up. I'm more admired. I'm praised and exalted. The better I look. So the better clothing, the better the hairdo, the better the body. Hardly anyone even goes to the gym anymore to get healthy. I'm guilty. I used to do that all the time. I just wanted to look good. I was so out of shape. I used to go to the gym and work out like a madman, and then I'd go out to the car and have a smoke. I couldn't even run around the block one time without, I wanted to have a stroke. But if you looked at me, I didn't have an ounce of fat on my body. It looked like, you know, I could run in the Olympics. I couldn't even breathe. I was doing it because I wanted people to like me more. The more I do, the more charitable I am, the better I look, the better I'll get. The more I do, the better I get. It's a cause and effect world that we live in, and you can't deny it, because it's true. But the gospel destroys this economy by dismantling this entitlement mentality that has me feeling that I am do something because of my effort and because of my behavior. That's the way we live. That's the culture that we live in. Now, when we started this We the People series, I introduced to you a vision slash mission statement for this church, and I hope that you wrote it down, but this is what it says. Revolution Church is a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world, okay? A a gospel-centered, culture-creating community bringing beauty to the world. In other words, here's the culture that we live in. And a revolution is a sudden and momentous shift in that status quo. So it brings a new culture to the world. See something more beautiful than what is. And people will buy into that when they see something that's better. If you say, hey, you're a sinner, you're going to hell. That don't work. But offer her something beautiful and she'll take it. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's what we're supposed to do. And as the, it, with the gospel at our center, we can change the economy of our world. In our world now, we do to get. That's the way it works. But let me remind you of something. On the cross at Calvary, this Jesus, who is God, who didn't need to do this, you did not seek him, you did not want him, no one is righteous, not even one. You didn't earn anything, you didn't want it, and he loved you so much that he went to the cross to pay for your sins so you could have life forever. You didn't get, you didn't make one effort for this, but he gave it to you Anyway, and that is how the gospel destroys this cause and effect mentality that we live in and that has a grab on us that will not let go. That's what we live in, and he wants to change that for us. You got the greatest thing ever for free. You did nothing. Could I remind you again that you did not seek him You did not want him. You were born passively with sin running through your veins because of Adam and Eve. And then you joined in on the party and you were actively rebelling against the God who created you to be like him and to worship him. And you said, heck no, I don't want that. I want to do it my way. And you were doing this actively every single day. And in that rebellion, in that act of rebellion, he willingly goes to the cross and pays your penalty so you could have life. You didn't want anything of him. But he gave you the greatest gift ever. And it's not that you didn't even want it. You earnestly pursued not receiving it. Come on, right? Don't leave me hanging. I'm not the only scumbag in this house, right? Okay, all of us. So, but Jesus gives you the greatest gift that you ever received and you didn't earn it. That's got to tell you something, right? And so this transitions, this whole gospel, this HD gospel transitions into we the people perfectly because a gospel-centered community means that we actually get to, to live uh, free, like a Jesus follower. He'll do this with me. This, I, I did this this week when I was getting ready, and it just felt real good. You ready? 
This is how you live as a Jesus follower. You guys want to do Put your Bible down a second. Put your pen down for a second. Come on. Come on. I know. You never hear me say that. I want you to do this. Look. Put your hands up like a funnel, right? Great. And say this. Grace getter. Forward. Grace giver. Grace getter. Grace giver. That's how we're supposed to live. That's how we're supposed to live. We receive grace, we give grace, right? It's not, you do this for me and then I'll. No, that needs to go where it belongs, in hell. That's not where it works. It's not the way it works, okay? So instead of, I'm nice, I'm fair, I'm good, I donate, I go to church, so God will love me and maybe let me into heaven, it's different. It's a whole different mindset. It's, no, I'm not nice. I'm not fair, I'm not uh, selfless, I'm selfish, I'm self-indulgent, I'm self-help, like I'm my own God and I'll fix it all the time. A better me is a better me. God will love me. You know what? God's just sitting up there going, you know what? I just need, I I got these big plans, but if I just had this middle-aged, fat, balding Jew with a big nose, if I could just have him on my team, we could get this thing done. Okay, that's not true. He doesn't need me. I'm awful. I'm awful. I didn't earn his love. I earned nothing. But yet, God loves me. He sends his son Jesus to fully absorb the penalty of all my rebellion. And what have I done? Nothing but earn death. (laughs) But I have life. Right? It's a whole new economy. It's a whole new economy. So, now, let's talk about how this mentality and I want, to tell, I want to encourage this to you, okay? If you come into this church and you don't hear me share what I've shared with you about the gospel, that you earn nothing and want nothing but you got, if you ever come in and don't hear it from me, you need to email me. Because you should never get tired of hearing that and you never ever should stop preaching that truth to yourself. Because it needs to invade the very dark areas of your day-to-day life or else he dies for nothing, okay? This is, this is how it invades a dark space, How many people in this room have ever had or have a boss they loathe? Come on. No one's ever, you never had a boss you didn't like? Okay. Listen, the camera's only on me, so no one's going to see your hand go up online. You can be honest, right? Most of us at one point will have a boss that they cannot stand. I've had them. I don't have that privilege anymore. My boss is Jesus. I have no option but to love, right? If he says yes, he says jump. How high? There's no option, right? There's no option. If God says do something, you do it. But let's, let's, let's talk about how the gospel can invade this dark space. You don't like your boss. And you don't want to work hard for that man or that woman because they drive you crazy. Because you do all the work and they get all the pay and you do all the work and they get all the glory. And they take weekends off while you're suffering at your job. Come on, right? All of us, we've all experienced this kind of stuff, right? And so we don't want to perform for him. So my boss, who's a complete jerk, now he can get my best. Now he can get my best. Not because I need his paycheck. Not because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. Why? I start preaching the gospel to myself. Is it that I'm going to give him my best because he's good to me? Is it am I going to give him my best because he pays me? Or is it that I realize that in his flesh, this boss of mine, he is dirt just like I was when Jesus died for me? Right? Do you think about that when you're at work? Listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't be thinking about those starving kids in Africa, but think about this for you. See, Jesus said in in, in Acts 1-8 that you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. He is going to be seen through you and the way you act at work is going to show Jesus or going to repel people from him. One or the other. There's There's no in between. There's no neutral. So if you will act like Jesus at work and give your boss the best, not because of who your boss is, not because of the money he gives you, but because, the, because Jesus gave you everything when you acted like a creep, when you were totally rebellious, when you were a total jerk to him, he gave you the greatest gift. He gave you his best. And we remind ourselves of this constantly, and then all of a sudden, I can give the boss the best that I have. And so I need to remind myself all the time that because of this gospel, that God's love was bestowed on me, a man who did nothing to deserve it. 
and I got it anyway, and so therefore I can do it for this boss who's a jerk to me, right? I'm not saying that it's easy, but that's why you don't go to church once a week. That's why you go to church every day by preaching the gospel to yourself every single day. So you're reminded of this thing. So when you go to work and he's a total jerk to you, you can give him your best because we don't serve man. We work as unto the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Do with me, do a favor for me. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Hopefully it's on the screen. I don't dare guess what page it says. I already lost 200 bucks. No, I didn't. Jared. Yeah, I gave him a wee-o. Checks in the mail, buddy. Colossians 3.23, right? 3.23 says this. Work, are you all there? If you don't have a Bible, there's plenty of them all over the place, Paul. Yeah, no, that's hers. There you go, buddy. You have it memorized, chef? I didn't think so. Here you go. Come on. Good. Don't drop God. That would be bad. A Jew threw it or did you throw it? Hey. Okay, you ready? Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will get, the Lord, not your boss, the, the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Right? Yeah, but. I can already sense the yeah, buts. Right? I've had them. Yeah, but what about my boss? You have no idea how much of a creep he or she is. You think you guys got it bad. You should come to work where I am. We could go back and forth and we could argue about who has the worst boss. You own the company. <laughs> You're the worst to work for. Listen, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. This, this is the great American Christian quote. Yeah, but. Like the gospel can invade an, an, an AIDS-ravished village with no plumbing and no water, right, and no hope. It can change that, but it can't change my boss. It can't change my workplace here. You have no idea how bad it is. Well, I want to invite you to see something here. I, I kind of, on purpose, I left it out. Look at verse 22, the verse before it. Who is this even written to? Is it someone with a bad job? It's to a slave. It's to a slave. It's to a man or a woman that doesn't get any income. Who is forced to work and, and, and sometimes die in the field to receive nothing except maybe something to eat and a place to sleep, which was probably a pile of straw. And again in Ephesians 6, Five through seven, same thing. Paul says the same thing to both churches. Why? Because it's common. We have a bad attitude. We think that we have this entitlement mentality here in America. I do this, I get this. And the only way I'm going to do this is if you're good to me. And it's not supposed to be that way. See, Jesus came to change that, gave us a new mindset. We preached the gospel to ourselves. I earned nothing. I wanted nothing. I didn't deserve anything, and he gave me the best. And so, therefore, now I can give my best even when they don't deserve anything good. And he says it to a slave. Who's got it as bad as a slave in here? No one. No one. If you have a job, your pay might suck, but you get something. You get something, oh, I can't work for $9 an hour. How about a slave? He says to the slave who's, who's hated by the world, looked down on, shunned, they're like not even a human being to some people. They get no money. They live in, in feces. And he says, listen, I want to shine light even into that darkness. You can live in slavery to man, yet free. You can be free because when, you don't, when your work ethic and your attitude is not, uh, is not established according to what that person is doing to you, your boss, when it's established because the gospel has set you free, it doesn't matter what they do to you, I'm free. I'm free. You know what I'm saying? I'm free. 
And it doesn't matter how rotten he is to me. I'm going to give him my best. He could spit on my face. I'll give him my best. And then I'll tell him why. You, you, listen, when a boss is a creep, he, he knows you. I've been a boss. And I know when I'm a creep to someone, they're going to be a creep back to me. You can't look at a full-blooded American man and think you're going to get away with anything. You say something, he's up in your grill, right? All the time. But listen, when, when you don't act the way they expect you to act, you've got their attention. And then you could share the gospel, the fact that you wanted nothing to do with him. You earned nothing. You were not seeking him, and he gave you the greatest gift you ever received, not on your own merit, but on his. You could share that gospel with him, and that might just change his life. And so we carry it even further. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do. Say whatever you do. So that means everything, right? Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Okay, so the gospel can invade the dark space at work. Let's just see where the gospel can invade here in another place. The gospel can also invade your marriage. Now, the one thing I didn't do, and I think Mark probably had it queued up. Do you have that video queued up? I do, actually. Okay, I want to introduce something to you. Since our church started, we're a, we're a new church. We're, still, we're only about three and a half years old, right? We're a baby. In that short time, and this is not some 10,000-person church where you just get lost in a crowd. We all know each other. In that short amount of time, we as a family have seen so many, I don't even know the numbers, so many marriages just either completely fall apart or are on the verge, and some of them get restored, but some of them are on the verge right now. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. Here's a world where 50, in our country, that 50% of marriages fall apart. And, and, but in the church, in the church, same number? Now, we, now, this is the arrogance I was talking about, the foolishness. We think that the gospel will save a, 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 sex, a sex slave trade and an and a, and a AIDS-infested village in Africa, but yet we will, yeah, but she, oh yeah, but, but he, please. Seriously? See, I remember, I, listen, I, and you guys know my history, so my, my, my marriage history is terrible. Listen, I make a commitment that it doesn't make any difference what my wife does. I made a commitment. I'm a Christian man. The world's going to see Jesus through me. I, ha I don't care if she punches me in the face. I have to stick it out. I have to stick it out no matter how much it hurts, right? So marriages fall apart so easily, but we want to fix it. So here's the thing. Starting in three weeks here on Tuesday nights, you know, we got a good thing going here on Tuesday nights with the guys. On Tuesday nights, we're going to give men tools to help with marriage, right? And, and it's not just for the ones who have had marriages that have failed. It's for those that are in marriages that are, are, that are even good, that could be better, right? I got a good marriage. It could be better. Just ask my wife. She'll tell you, right? Still throwing all my clothing on the floor. It's awful. She hates when I snort. I got these boogers. That I got a booger problem. It could get better. But listen, there's also a lot of young men in this church. Most of the people that come to our Tuesday night thing are young, unmarried men. But you know, wouldn't it be great if their church wasn't negligent and they actually gave them the tools? Men like tools, don't you? Men like tools. Don't you, wouldn't it be great to get the men the tools that they need so that their marriage would, and their family would flourish for a lifetime? That's what we need to do. So this is where we're going to start um, here in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Three weeks, I guess it is. Check this out on Tuesday nights. Guys, while there are many important relationships in a man's life, none deserve more care, focus, and investment than his relationship with his wife. You are your biggest enemy to your own marriage. You're committed to your wife for life till death do us part. Marriage, easier said than done, but everybody's doing it, pursuing it, no understanding, standing under the weight of what this really means, so they ruin it. There's a bigger purpose for marriage. 
and a grander vision of what it can be. Become a lifelong student of your wife. Learn her tendencies, her unique needs, her aspirations. A man's marriage is meant to be and can be an incredible source of energy, joy, and intimacy. The ultimate purpose for marriage is not human happiness. The ultimate purpose of marriage is holiness. The purpose of marriage, I don't know. Uh... It doesn't matter what you do, it matters about what you think. The person that I just had sex with is not mine. She just not You're gonna die to yourself so that she can flourish. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we're going to start in three weeks. And listen, now the reason why I want to announce it in our gathering and not just on a Tuesday night is because this is the opportunity for the ladies to gut check him right now and make him get up and see Mark before he leaves because Mark's like our resident 33 guy. And so we're going to take book orders. There's a study guide that goes with this thing. And so now's your chance. Go ahead, just punch him and make him go. Because if you leave it up to a man, they won't go because we're lazy and we think we got it all figured out. So now's your chance to gut check your husband and make sure, look at them kissing. No, you don't need to go. I don't need to go, do I, honey? No, you're perfect, right? <laughs> you're perfect. So listen, if you would like to be a part of that thing and so that your family can flourish, please see Mark. I don't know if, what your plans are, but just for a few minutes before you leave, if you want to order the book, I think they're like 15 bucks. It's a worthwhile investment. If you love your wife, you love your kids, you love your church, you love your city, you love your Jesus, I would say go ahead and invest in the 15 bucks for the book, okay? Let's move on. So let's talk about this thing about marriage here in, in this context here with everybody. The gospel can change my marriage this way. How about this? Um, who's ever bought a car? Who's ever gone to a dealership and bought a car, okay? So you go to the car dealership, and, and you go in, and you, and, and you, and you pick the, the, the model, and the color, and the features, and it's got to have this motor, and it's got to have this, and it's got to have that, and don't forget, it has to have a guarantee and a warranty, because if it doesn't perform the way I want it to, do you, you see where I'm going? Yeah. If it doesn't perform the way I want it to, I could get my money back. That's what marriage is now in our country. See, see that's what happens. And, and, and how about this? How about, could the gospel invade your marriage this way? Wouldn't it be refreshing? Could you, now I'm a man, so I'm going to talk about my wife. Could, would, my, would my wife flourish as a, as a, as a person, right, if, if she didn't have to any, any longer earn my love or earn my respect or earn my affections? If, 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 but listen, listen, here's what the gospel invades. If, J, if Jesus lays down his life for me when I was an enemy of God, right? That's what the scriptures say. I'm an enemy of God because there are evil thoughts and actions. I'm, I'm not within the family yet. And he lays down his life for me while I was a sinner, when I was terrible, right? If he'll do that for me, maybe I could maybe preach that to myself once in a while and re, maybe give that to my wife the way Jesus gave it to me. That, that like, listen, I didn't earn Jesus' love. I didn't earn his respect. I didn't earn his, his affections. Why? He was freely given to me, not on my performance. So imagine the freedom that you give mama when she doesn't have to try to earn your affection or love anymore. She can truly flourish. It has nothing to do with her. It has everything to do with him, right? And so if you can pass that same love that he gave to you on to her, it makes it so much easier when you get to sections of the scripture where it says like in Ephesians 5, lay down your life for your wife. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her. And you're like, oh, Kind of like the way you did for me. Oh. So maybe I can do that for her. Maybe she doesn't have to be like a car that if, it do, if she doesn't do the laundry the way I like it, if she doesn't look the way I think she should look, if she doesn't say the things that I think she should say, if she doesn't cook for me and clean for me and do it the way I want. My house isn't the way I like it when I get home. Whatever, dude, you're lucky she's there. There's no superstar model guys in here, okay? If you even have a chick, you're lucky. Come on now. Kyle ain't here no more, you know what I'm saying? He's the only one that might get away with it. Pretty boy ain't in the house no more, Jared. We could pick on him freely. <laughs> Woo! He'll be back next week. Don't tell him I said this. 
Listen, how much, can you flourish? Can your wife flourish when she doesn't have to try to earn your love? Could, could the husband flourish when he doesn't have to try to earn your love and your affection? You just freely give it to him because that's what Jesus gave to you when you didn't earn it? Man, it's a whole new way of thinking, isn't it? It's awesome. It's awesome. And listen, I got to give you some other advice, guys. This came to me late, but it's true. If we're to love like Jesus loved the church, then you need to lay your life down for your wife even if she doesn't accept it, even if she spits in your face when you do it. That's real love. See, Jesus went to the cross, and, and, and the Bible says that the, that, the, that the highway to hell is wide, and the narrow road, very few people ever find that road. Right? He knew when he went to that cross, when he was stretched and whipped and beaten and killed, he knew most people aren't even going to say yes to him. And he still lays down his life willingly for you. And so we can now do that for our wives. We can love our wife like Christ loved the church. When we realize that he loved me that way. And so this is a gospel-centered mentality that we have to have. This is a gospel-centered mentality that brings a beautiful new way of living to the world. See, the gospel frees you to live as God intended not being run by rules, not being run by restriction, not being run by reciprocal behavior. You do this for me, and I'll do this for you. And the only way I'm going to do this for you is if you'll do this for me. If you're a really good wife the way I think you should be, then I'll be a good husband to you. Please. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. See, I think, I, think, I wasn't at everybody's wedding here, but I think you made some commitments about for better or worse. So when she's at your worst, husband, what are you supposed to be? Your best. When, and, and husbands, when you're at your worst, mama, what are you supposed to be? Your best. And see, when we both do that and in, in our, in our decisions on how we should act are outside of what our spouse does, there's peace. There's tranquility. There's cooperation. There's love. And there's success. There's success. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for success. We're not to live by this reciprocal thing where if you do this for me, I do this for you. If my car performs the way I want it to, then it doesn't work that way. See, it's a, it's a bit more romantic than that. It's a bit more romantic than that. See, God didn't see who you were and what you did and go, oh, he's just, she's just so awesome and so I love her. No, you suck. I mean, let's just face it, Right? And, and, and so, so it's like, no, when the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin, yeah, you're a, 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 just a raging sinner. And, but, but God goes to the cross and he lays love over your sin, right? And so therefore, if we're to be like Christ, then that same principle applies in my life because God's love covered a multitude of my sin. Therefore, I preached myself the gospel again, and therefore now love can cover the same multitude of sins in other people's lives. It's not based. My love for them is not based on what they do for me or to me. Okay? So the gospel offers a better way of living, I hope. At least in those two areas, let's talk about some other dark areas. Okay? We finally get to our text. You in uh, Romans 13? Mm-hmm. Romans 13, verse 8. We just want to invade another dark spot. Right? This is not, a, this is not a, 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 a AIDS-infected, drought-ravaged village in, in India. This is right here. In, in not just in, in Eustace, not just in Revolution Church, but right in your own life, right? In your own house, right? In your own heart. You guys all there? Okay, Romans 13, verse 8. Uh, let me just do a little reading, okay? Oh, nothing... To anyone, I said very little reading. I meant it. Oh, nothing. I love, you know, I love sections of scripture that are just like to the point. You know, there's, there's mysteries in the Bible. I mean, this stuff like go explain the Trinity. I don't understand it, right? It makes no sense. But there's some places in the scripture that are like, boom, you get it. And this is one of them. And I love this because I'm kind of a simple minded guy. Michael, amen. I'm a simple-minded guy. Amen. Thanks. <laughs> oh, nothing. That's pretty clear, right? Oh, nothing.